Paris of 1830 was a world music center. It was here that dozens of prodigious virtuoso pianists performed. Frederick Kalkbrenner, Sigmund Thalberg, Alexander Dreyschock, Frederick Chopin. Some of them bewitched their audiences, creating illusions and introducing special effects which were unknown at the time. They became affectionately referred to as the Flying Trapeze Artists. One, more than the others, surpassed every expectation in this category. His exceptional charm, capacity to draw the crowds time after time, concert after concert, creator of legends and gossip. This was the pianist and composer, Franz Liszt. What's new? Nobody ever wrote anything like that before Liszt. And Liszt was the, the first composer who tried to use the piano the way Paganini used the violin, making actually very frightening sounds. I mean, something like that. For example, nobody had ever done that on the piano before. Liszt was able to do things on the piano, on the keyboard, no one else after him has been able to do. In that respect, he was truly a unique figure, a true revolutionary. Someone who took the art of piano playing on a completely new level. I think every young pianist has dreams of playing Liszt's piano music. Uh, to many people and to be all over the piano and uh, and I think I definitely had those those dreams of course I was drawn to the uh, to the elan and the panache and the grace and the daring of this composer of course I was not as uh, <laughs> technically gifted to be able to realize all those dreams but uh, but I th but I had the dreams nonetheless found new ways of making the piano sound full, orchestral, with chords, huge chords, with uh, rapid staccato, thundering octaves, arpeggios, of which he could, a six thirds, which he could perform to perfection himself. For example, the limitation of three hands at a time, that he does in the studio a suspiro, um, con Era un uomo affascinante, un grande parlatore, eh, sapeva, sapeva essere a suo agio in tutti gli ambienti e poi un uomo che aveva anche dei movimenti segreti del suo animo. Era un uomo quanto mai contraddittorio. Mi sarebbe piaciuto conoscerlo. Quali sono le due tendenze che spezzano in due l'anima di Liszt e hanno tormentato la sua vita? E una è la, la straordinaria disposizione all'eros e poi invece l'altra tendenza che è rarissima nei compositori dell'Ottocento cioè la tendenza mistica Franz Liszt era un cattolico un cattolico quindi fervente direi al punto 
che arrivò a prendere gli ordini minori, che entrò a far parte dello Stato clericale. Sono quei misteri in cui uno si può muovere soltanto sul campo così delle ipotesi, delle supposizioni. Ecco. Cosa passa effettivamente dentro di un'anima, è un'anima grande come era quella di Franz Liszt, solo forse lui lo sapeva, forse neppure lui, ecco, forse solo Dio lo sa questo. Liszt was born in Riding, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, to humble parents. His father was in charge of some 50,000 sheep belonging to Princess de Rossi. His mother was a housemaker. It was the 22nd of October, 1811. Riding, così si chiama in tedesco, il borgo dove nasce Liszt, oppure Doborian, se vogliamo dire il nome di questo borgo in ungherese, era un luogo in cui una famiglia di origine tedesca era al servizio di un nobile che portava un illustre cognome ungherese, ma era al servizio dei monarchi von Habsburg. Quindi gli elementi connotati che rendono più tedesca che ungherese la figura di Liszt sono in dubbi. Si aggiungono poi le sue prime peregrinazioni, dato che si trattava di un enfant prodige, il padre lo porta naturalmente in terra tedesca, a Vienna, i primi trionfi sono in città tedesche. Liszt received his first piano lessons at the age of eight from his father Adam, who was only a modest musician, but who introduced the boy to Bach, Mozart and early Beethoven. But Father Liszt soon understood that his services as a teacher were insufficient for France. He took him to Vienna, where he studied with Antonio Salieri, formerly the teacher of Schubert, and also Czerny, a pupil of Beethoven. At the age of 12, he moved to Paris, a strategic center for Adam's project, a series of tours in Europe of an astonishing enfant prodige. The success was overwhelming. At only 13, he performed at Windsor Castle for George IV. But in August 1827, during a pause on the tour, his father died of typhoid near Boulogne-sur-Mer. Francis' grief was profound. The tours were cancelled, and in order to live, Liszt began to give piano lessons. Even as a young man, Liszt was drawn to the church. It's hard to know what his um, real motivations were because Liszt operated on many different planes, um, I think, psychologically and in his life. La prima delusione amorosa lo ha portato a cercare rifugio nel, nella chiesa e è stato il suo confessore che lo ha sconsigliato, che gli ha praticamente impedito di entrare in seminario. Liszt so forcibly renounced his public life that Le Corsair Parisien published news of his death, only to have this immediately corrected by Madame Elix from the school where Liszt taught. Dopo due o tre concerti, lo sforzo emotivo e fisico era tale che gli si metteva a letto a Parigi e un giornale annunciò il suo necrologio perché correva voce che un concerto lo avesse ucciso. obituary proved a good omen. In a few months, Liszt became protected by many Parisian noblewomen, in whose salons he was immediately invited to play. At this time, his immense charisma, not only as a pianist, but as a man, began to flourish, as too did his appeal to the fairer sex. In Liszt, eh, come è noto, c'era una fortissima disposizione, forse un elemento magiaro, se vogliamo, filtrato, 
carnale proprio, alla libido. No? La contessa Adele de la Prunared, per esempio, una donna sui 30 anni, lo invitò, lo sequestrò praticamente, scomparve dalla circolazione, evidentemente passarono, passarono giorni interi insieme, no? in eh, posizioni intime e così via. Non osiamo pensarlo. All'inizio lui era proprio come un film star. In questa epoca era molto facile prendere qualche malattia facendo una vita sessuale un po' leggera. Probabilmente è stato più furbo in confronto con compositori tipo Schubert, Schumann, che aveva Paganini, tutti e tre avevano sifilide. Liszt è rimasto in buona forma per tutta la vita, anche ha vissuto più o meno a lungo, a 75 anni. E il suo destino, poi, se posso fermarmi su questo, lo porterà ad un curioso incontro. Egli sarà il compagno della contessa Marie d'Agoul e da lei avrà, come è noto, dei figli. In the beginning of 1833, in a musical evening, Liszt met Marie Catherine Sophie di Flavigny, 28, married to Count Constant d'Agoul and instantly smitten with the pianist. Liszt deve scappare da Parigi perché aveva messo incinta Marie d'Agoul, che era una donna sposata con figli. E quindi eh, lo scandalo sarebbe stato gravissimo perché si potevano avere degli amanti ma non si potevano fare dei figli bastardi. Quindi scappano a Ginevra dove nasce la prima figlia. Franz Liszt was tall and extremely thin. His expression bore the marks of suffering. His face was pale and his large sea green eyes shone like a wave when the sunlight catches it. No words can express the effect that he caused in me. From the beginning, our conversations were very serious and by common accord, quite free of anything banal. Without hesitation, without effort, by the natural inclination of our souls, we embarked at once upon elevated subjects which alone had any interest for us. We talked of the destiny of mankind, of its sadness and incertitude, of the soul and of God. Franz spoke with vivacity, an abundance, an originality of impressions that awoke a whole world that had been slumbering in me. And when he left me, I was sunk in reveres without end. The voice of the young enchanter, his vibrant speech, opened out before me a whole infinity, now luminous, now somber, forever changing, into which my thoughts were plunged and lost. Alla fine di agosto del 1837, Franz Liszt e Marie Dagou lasciano Ginevra, la calvinista Ginevra, per arrivare sulle sponde del lago di Como. He was only 26 years old already a famous virtuoso, uh, wowing the Parisian saloons with his great virtuosity. To Italy he came, I think, to refine his, his um, let's say, his art of composition. Questo è Sposalizio, un brano di grande tenerezza, di grande candore, come lo è il quadro a cui è ispirato, che è appunto lo Sposalizio della Vergine di Raffaello, che Liszt vide a Milano, a Brera, da cui fu molto colpito. E il candore dello Sposalizio tra Maria e Giuseppe, qui trasferito con un timbro particolarmente morbido, 
una linea molto semplice ma anche molto intensa, molto interiore. Anne de Pellerinage Italia è una raccolta di brani tutti legati all'arte italiana e alla letteratura italiana. Quindi, eh, mentre prima i viaggi di Liszt erano viaggi nella natura o nella passione, questo diventa un viaggio nell'arte. L'arte in qualche modo sublima, eh, sublima i sentimenti di passione legati all'amore carnale ad un livello più alto, più spirituale. My vision took wing on the plains of Lombardy as I drank in the perfumed breezes of this land blessed by heaven which are like sighs of love like a faithful and serene prayer <sighs> Italy Italy yes men of inspiration philosophers painters or poets will always feel themselves tormented by a secret pain a burning desire for you The yearning for Italy will always be an affliction for beautiful souls. A bad piano, a few books, the conversation of a serious-minded woman suffice for him. He renounces all the pleasures of pride, the excitement of the battle, the amusements of social life, even the joy of being useful to others and of doing good. He has given them all up without even realizing, apparently, that he has done so. It's very difficult to know exactly what stimuli um, operate on a composer to write. On the surface, you can say that Liszt wrote only from stimuli, from external stimuli, but I don't believe that completely because of the physical contact that he has with an instrument. The nature, his musical nature is pianistic. So I think a lot of his talent and inspiration was caught up um, in his mind, his brain, his heart, to his fingers. This process was very, very strong. When you write the story of two happy lovers, set it on the shores of Lake Como. From the house where I live, I feel the sad lament of the waves that die breaking against the rocks and I see the last rays of the sun that disappear in gold behind the mountain. How many times I felt the urge to destroy the miserable instrument on which I play, losing all hope of expressing even a small part of what I've experienced. Poor artists. There are brief flashes during which one seems to have intuition of divine things, but. The moment one wants to give voice to these feelings, to give form to our soul's brief flights, they flee, the illusion is cancelled, the god vanishes, and the man remains alone in the presence of a work without life which the gaze of the crowd will all too soon strip of the last vestiges of its nobility. The tour in Italia, the viaggio in Italia, is eh, the viaggio alla scoperta della civiltà greco-romana e della civiltà rinascimentale italiana. Per lui è importante la conoscenza dell'arte di Raffaello, per esempio, eh, della pittura del, del trionfo della morte nel Camposanto di Pisa e poi della letteratura, perché la Dagul conosceva la lingua italiana e quindi insieme con la Dagul Liszt legge il Petrarca e legge Dante. Questa è l'apertura del sonetto del Petrarca, Benedetto sia il giorno. In questo brano Liszt quindi traspone in musica la delicatezza ma anche la forza 
dell'innamoramento espressa già da Petrarca con quei versi. In particolare il canto principale, dove lui inizialmente aveva pensato ad un, ad un canto, proprio ad una voce umana, che è infatti la prima versione è appunto per canto e pianoforte, e è una melodia particolarmente sinuosa che appunto unisce delicatezza e forza insieme. His melodies often take, are based on large skips, but always with, a, with an extreme elegance. Liszt's vocal writing, of course, is often inspired by the bel canto, which, with which he grew up um, experiencing. Equally, the relationship um, to the from, with voice and piano. There's a wonderful exchange. songs you have someone who is explaining their innermost feelings but doing it not only with melody not only with beauty of phrase but with a dramatic utterance almost a recitativo on top of a continuing bed of harmony Il lago di Como, pur con tutte le bellezze naturali, con gli scenari meravigliosi, rappresentava anche un punto d'approdo verso una meta più importante, Milano e la Scala. Parlando della Scala, Liste fa delle critiche ha delle critiche molto dure anche nei confronti della Scala perché la vita musicale italiana era tutta centrata sul melodramma e il melodramma era tutto centrato sui divi. La Scala is in a state of decadence and it's difficult to see it ever improving. Putting on an opera what the Italians call opera seria is anything but serious. The audience chatter and sleep. The musicians, generally of a sluggish nature, are not in the theatre as artists, but as wage earners. The newspaper Il Pirata printed a piece with a large print headline, Guerra al Signor List, War Against Mr. List. The ridiculous title and the rudeness of the article made me refuse all comment. So, who could possibly believe that I indulged in vomiting insults against Milanese society or that I attacked the honor of her husbands, the virtue of her wives, or the compassion of her mothers. Liszt, I mean, was very close to the whole operatic tradition in the Don Giovanni fantasy, the... ...becomes a violoncello solo. That, uh, Liszt, that Liszt transcriptions are so extraordinary is that he actually recomposes the drama of the opera.
what he's doing there, he combines the cemetery sequence with the overture and part of the finale. I mean, he's rewriting the whole opera at that beginning. And uh, he does the same thing with the rest of the opera, sort of makes a kind of overview of the opera as a whole rather than arranging individual parts. Operatic music of the time harmonically was quite simple. Liszt reharmonizes, reimagines, um, revitalizes the theme, gives it um, an almost visionary uh, possibility, creating uh, not only interest in the theme, but interest in what he is doing to enhance what, what is his genius, which is to provide variation, transformation, virtuosity, atmosphere. Liszt aveva un'idea molto viva, molto sentita, molto esigente per lui, che era quella di rendere popolare la musica strumentale. Il, la musica era soprattutto musica di chiesa, alla, la sentivano tutti, e musica teatrale che aveva un pubblico vastissimo, mentre la musica strumentale non aveva ancora l'istituzione del concerto sinfonico e quindi eh, Liszt stava pensando a come rendere democratica l'arte della musica strumentale che era soprattutto aristocratica. Ad esempio quando ha deciso di trascrivere tutte le sinfonie per, di Beethoven per pianoforte, fa un suono che sembra come un'orchestra di Beethoven, anche se le note non sono precisamente quelle che ha scritto Beethoven, tipo... piano to imitate other instruments with greater, something like in that Rhapsody. Which is, imitates the symbol of, of Hungarian instrument. fantasia quasi sonata dopo la lettura di Dante, forse il più importante brano che Liszt ha composto per pianoforte in Italia e in assoluto uno dei più importanti brani del repertorio pianistico ottocentesco. È un brano che simboleggia la grandezza di Liszt come un autore di grandi affreschi musicali, forse più di ogni altro è riuscito a mettere in musica paesaggi, colori, atmosfere, in questo caso ispirandosi chiaramente a Dante, in particolare alla Divina Commedia. In origine era in due movimenti, non in uno. È stata ritrovata anche, esiste il manoscritto a Weimar, e ci sono i dischi con la prima versione. Anche lì abbiamo almeno quattro versioni della sonata Dante. Non sappiamo bene eh, se si riferisca solo all'inferno o non soltanto all'inferno. La tesi più comune è che si riferisca all'inferno e in particolare si è centrato sull'episodio di Paolo e Francesca. Bellissimo quando eh, Dante chiede a Virgilio chi sono quei due.
E il racconto di Paolo e Francesca è alternato da singhiozzi, agrimoso, scrive Liste, quindi questa grande sofferenza umana ma al contempo infernale. I have to admit anyway that in this immense, incomparable poem there is one thing which has always bothered me. This is the way the poet perceives Beatrice not as the ideal of love, but as the ideal of wisdom. I don't like finding in that beautiful, transfigured body the spirit of a theologically gifted woman, explaining dogma, combating heresy and discussing mysteries. It's certainly not with reason and philosophical argument that woman reigns in the heart of man. She doesn't have to prove to him the existence of God, but to cause it to be felt by him and to draw him towards heavenly things. Almost all of this music is a poetical scenario. There is always a story behind what he's trying to say. And if you just cannot buying away on the instrument, you also have to coax the gentler elements, the most poetical elements. These are always the greatest interpreters of this. They don't have to be, you don't have to play this music fast, but you have to articulate, like an actor. In Liszt's particular case, one could draw even more parallels between musical performance and acting. The literary um, inspiration uh, in a work goes through uh, different states of being, uh, the beginning of journey, storytelling uh, is a tremendously important um, element that I think Liszt was naturally drawn to. As a pianist, he was a storyteller. As far as we know from his contemporaries' recollections, there was often a striking element of theater present in his performances, in his uh, stage behavior. Esiste poi nel catalogo delle composizioni di Liszt una serie privilegiata, sa, i suoi capolavori maggiori per pianoforte, una serie privilegiata di composizioni che sono accomunate da un aggettivo trascendentale. L'illuminazione dell'interprete dinanzi al pubblico fa sì che l'interprete diventi un attore e quindi una luce della ribalta, quindi fa parte della categoria spettacolare della musica. La musica è anche spettacolo. Transcendental Etudes, the first version he wrote when he was 16, which are very easy. Then he wrote another version, which is superhuman. And then a little later, he made those a little bit more playable for the average pianist. Aveva composto questi pezzi all'età di 13 anni, la prima versione, che avrà mostrato a Cerny con un po' di fierezza, in cui vediamo almeno l'origine dell'idea, ma tipo... Uh, nel 37, uh, questo è diventato... 
che è ridicolamente difficile. Eh, quando arriva finalmente agli studi trascendentali. Eh. che è già difficile, ma in confronto con l'altra versione è più normale. Marie de Gaulle and Liszt left Lombardy in 1838, visiting numerous Italian cities including Genoa, Verona, Padova, Vicenza, Venice, Bologna and Rome, before settling in September 1839 in the Tuscan estate of San Rosore. Il suo giorno in Toscana è altrettanto importante perché Liszt matura varie cose. Lì arrivano i primi schizzi della sonata Dante, cosiddetta sonata Dante, del primo e del secondo, anche del terzo concerto che poi non verrà mai più ripreso e del terzo tentanza, ispirato al trionfo della morte del Camposanto di Pisa che allora era attribuito ad Andrea Orcagna. In November 1839, Liszt and Marie de Gaulle separated. France made for Venice, Trieste and Vienna, where he played a series of charity concerts to raise funds for the construction of a monument to Beethoven to commemorate 75 years from his birth. With these concerts, they began a new phase of Liszt's life, dubbed by the poet Heinrich Hein as Listomania. This period was most significant in his life, and more than a century later was turned into a movie with the English rock star Roger Daltrey. Between 39 and 47, Liszt traveled the length and breadth of Europe, playing more than a thousand concerts, offering audiences previously unheard musical experiences and creating a collective hysteria. These were the world's first properly called piano recitals. When he played for the Russian Tsar, the, des de the despotic Nicholas I, who had an insolence to start talking while Liszt was playing. And then Liszt simply stopped playing, and when the Tsar asked him what the matter was, he replied, when your majesty is talking, everybody has to be silent. And that, as we know, drove the Tsar into a few seconds of silence. Obviously, he was not used to this kind of behavior. And then he simply said, Mr. Liss, your carriage is waiting for you. And then Liss was informed that he had to leave the capital in 24 hours. 
the relationship with Marie de Gaulle gradually deteriorated. The Countess suffered nervous breakdowns with increasing frequency, and though she had no concrete proof, she could not abide being only one of Liszt's many lovers. Franz abandoned me for futile reasons. Not to write a masterpiece or for lack of faith or patriotism, but only for the success of the saloons, the glory of collecting the invitations of the princesses. At times I feared going mad. My mind is worn and tired. My heart and my spirit have dried up. It is a disturbance with which I must have been born. For an instant, passion had elevated me, but now I could not breathe. I am an obstacle in his life. I am inadequate. I bring sadness and discouragement to his days. It was in 1847 at a concert in Kiev that Liszt met the Princess Caroline von Sein Wittgenstein. They immediately began a profound sentimental relationship, and it would be the Princess to convince Liszt to abandon concert touring. A year later, the couple settled at Weimar, where Liszt was named director of the court theatre. Here, he consolidated his fame as a composer and conductor, dedicating himself with passion to teaching. His conducting style was based on the phrase, not on the bar line. So you, conducting evolved, obviously, from one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, for most classical music. Um, basically, conductor was a time beater. All of a sudden, Liszt, during his Weimar period, he had an orchestra at his disposal. He evolved a style of, of uh, conducting that had a fluidity, an up and down, uh, uh, hills and valleys that were part of storytelling that have become something today that I think it still has a tremendous influence. When Liszt was at Weimar, he had a position di grande dominio, importante, di potere in Germania e c'è stata una lotta molto violenta contro di lui, non tanto contro di lui, non soltanto contro di lui, quanto contro il fatto che, contro il fatto che lui aveva molti allievi e questi allievi eh, sarebbero andati ad occupare dei posti di potere in Germania. One can say that Liszt invented the master class. He decided that he no longer wanted to devote himself to himself, but he devoted himself to others and especially to young artists and to young composers who were to be the school, the music of the future. Ok, si comincia con questo, c'è scritto sottovoce, forse non così espressivo all'inizio, perché dobbiamo stabilire questa atmosfera, molto cupo, dove è quasi nel caos esce questo pezzo inquietante. Più forza. Ok, però il silenzio è importante. Capito? Io non so se farò così secco. Per me... Questo è il diavolo. 
habla un poco irónico. Sí. The Sonata in B minor of Liszt is one of the greatest works in the Romantic literature. And for me, his absolute masterpiece. The Sonata is based upon uh, the legend of Faust. That is the struggle between the good and the bad, and one man asking for absolute knowledge, who's willing to sell his soul to the devil for this, is incarnated in this Sonata like a little opera. It starts off dramatically, the curtain rises, you see the whole scene, I would say the scene of the soul of Liszt. It's a little bit of his auto-portrait. It's also a portrait his, of his contradictions as a human being. What I find particularly impressive about the sonata is the, how Liszt develops the same short motives throughout the whole long piece how many different moods he brings into those. The two short motives that appear at the very beginning one after the other. And He had a greater talent for any, than any other composer for changing the character of, uh, of a motive. I mean, something like... You have... becomes... I mean, the combination of to that and that, I mean, that it, it, it changes all the time. It, uh, the motive, it motive has never the same sense in, in list as it goes through the piece. It keeps having a different meaning every time it appears. Is that uh, not even Beethoven could do that with the power that Liszt had. Liszt would compose a theme and instead of having second subjects and, and a third subject, um, he would transform this theme to become the second subject. This theme, um, in all its alterations, in all its transformations, would give these works unity. So instead of using the traditional classical sonata form, um, his development of 
of the, the themes would be about transforming one idea, and one idea having many, many different faces. Come finì il soggiorno a Weimar? Finì con un atto di, di, di bontà, di generosità, di, di gentilezza eroico, di, di nobiltà. Cioè, lui voleva promuovere un compositore giovane, isolato, che nessuno ascoltava e di cui lui pensava bene, cioè Peter Cornelius, e insistette per rappresentare il barbiere di Baghdad, un'opera bellissima e sfortunatissima di Cornelius. Scoppiò uno scandalo furibondo, accuse di avere eh, danneggiato la, la, la fama, il prestigio del teatro di Weimar con un'opera che non si capiva bene se fosse seria o comica. Il crimine era questo. Liszt blamed himself for the flop of Cornelius and offered his resignation. After these two years at Weimar, he transferred to Rome with Princess von Sein Wittgenstein in order to fulfill her desire to marry. Sebbene vivesse con la, la Sein Wittgenstein a Weimar, erano due concubini conclamati, per cui lei non poteva essere ricevuta alla corte di Weimar, ma vivevano insieme e, e avevano due due inginocchiatoi nella camera da letto per cui al mattino si alzavano e dicevano le preghiere. Liszt, dopo un passato burrascoso, eh, sentimentalmente e addirittura di concovinaggio, viene a Roma però per contrarre un matrimonio, quindi già per una sistemazione religiosa diciamo, della sua vita. Ecco. Questo matrimonio che doveva celebrarsi, ma all'ultimo momento ci fu un ripensamento del marito di lei che ancora non concedeva il divorzio, poi quando finalmente fu concesso il divorzio i due erano ormai invecchiati, eh, sia lui che lei ormai vagavano verso lidi meditativi e mistici. Naturalmente rimane colpito da, 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 dalla vita della Chiesa, della presenza stessa del Papa che, che gli vuol bene, che l'accoglie, che l'aiuta, al Cardinale Hohenlohe, che lo avvicinano, eh, che lo ammirano, che lo vogliono coinvolgere in quest'opera musicale proprio liturgica de, 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 della riforma della musica sacra, quindi questo può spiegare che a un dato momento ha come una specie di folgorazione. I don't want to sound cynical, I'm not cynical at all by nature, but uh, I think uh, it's not so difficult to become an abbot in one's late 60s or early 70s. having slept with hundreds of women in, er, earlier in one's life. Why not repent and become abstinent at the end of one's life? Quando, per varie vicissitudini, il matrimonio con la Sainz Wittgenstein diventa impossibile, eh, Liszt rinuncia al matrimonio, prendendo gli ordini minori, 
diventando esorcista, poteva anche esorcizzare. E questo credo fosse molto, molto divertente per lui che era così ad usato a, a frequentare Mefistofele. Lo scherzo in marcia è il pezzo in cui si sente per la prima volta qualcosa infernale. Non è ancora chiamato Mefisto Valza, ma... Questo è un nuovo modo di scrivere, ma anche un'armonia un che per 1849 era molto vicino a una mancanza di tonalità. Something very unexpected happened uh, to Liszt as a composer in the very late years. He started writing pieces that you could say were almost sketches, short pieces, unusual title, Nuage Gris. Um, um, which were spare, very few notes, open harmonies, dissonance. I think this music very much influenced the future, Debussy, Bartok certainly. Um, were they serious compositions? I, it's hard to know. They were reflections on a life, there were reflections on music, on which way is music going, but not storms, reflection, contemplation. Questo è un sogno, Andrei, un brano che Liszt appunto, ha composto negli ultimi anni e che rappresenta l'aspetto più intimo, più eh, sublime se vogliamo, per alcuni più moderno, per altri più banale, cioè chi ritiene che questo sia un brano eh, come dire, senile, in un senso naturalmente limitante e negativo, invece per altri è un brano moderno in cui Liszt appunto, rinuncia volontariamente alle sonorità grandiose, fastose del suo pianismo per ridursi all'essenziale. In the late years at, uh, he was uh, he remained a bit isolated um, is that and he it had it was in a way he was a disappointed man at the end because is that he'd had this famous career as a pianist which he considered to be somehow uh, not really very distinguished. He didn't think being a pianist was such a good idea that he actually, for the last decades of his life, he almost never played in public. È affascinante l'ultimo list perché sembrerebbe veramente imporsi una disciplina. La tecnica pianistica nelle composizioni per pianoforte diventa austera. La scrittura orchestrale diventa secca, gotica. Eppure eh, è come se uscisse un aroma di vecchi legni preziosi da queste composizioni. The seductions of the world have had little effect on me. My small apparent successes mummified me rather than enriching my solitary life in the depths of my soul. Only in this I find the things the entire world cannot give. 
It would be a mistake to think that external motives would have pushed me into becoming a libertine abbot. It was a profound need of my heart to belong truly to this church which I wanted to serve. From this point of view, my life formed a complete circle. The aspirations of my youth and those of my old age are united. Love saved me from myself. Art saved me from love. Religion saved me from art. Because all things come to an end except for God.